And unless there's, I don't think we're missing anybody other than uh, Dorothy. Just Kurt, but he's usually a few minutes late. Okay. Okay, well, we'll we can proceed, I guess, and he can just jump in. Um, am I coming through okay? Because some of you are not coming through okay to me. Now, I didn't have a problem in the meeting this morning, but uh, anyway, I'll let you know if you've froze, frozen on me, but I, I have no, I'm not in my, in the studio. I'm in my, in my house right now. So the, the router is generally pretty good here. Okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna call the meeting to order then. Uh, good to see everybody. I hope that sometime before our term ends, we can actually meet in person. I don't know what the thinking on that is, but I'm sure it's it's in the negative at the moment. Um, I, I, I'm assuming you've all had a good summer, and uh, I can't believe we're meeting on the on the well, almost Thanksgiving weekend. It seems uh, seems impossible. Anyway, it was a lovely day today. It was nice to be outside, and I'm getting. I got my snow shovel out today. I mean, I got it off off the rack. Anyway, um. We have an agenda and you've all seen it. Is, are there any additions or thoughts about, about the agenda? Anything missing? I take that as a no, unless I'm missing something. We're required to ask if anyone has a pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act in any of the proceedings that we're about to undertake. All quiet on that too. Okay. Um, you have the minutes in front of you. Any comments or reflections on the minutes? Well, we're, we're having a, a quick, a quick start here. Um, I'm assuming that by consensus, we can consider that the minutes are acceptable as they are and move on. Uh, I, there's not, there are no presentations or announcements listed on the agenda. So, and we have no delegations. So I think you're up Spencer. You're going to speak to the uh, Jack R. McDonald funding. Yeah, that was quick. I was hoping to ease into this a little bit more, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so Dorothy, give me her- We'll go slow. What's that? We'll go slow. Um, Dorothy, your report to present to you today. Um, everyone should, does everybody have the, uh, the images, the, these things? I think they're attached to the agenda. Open that. If you hit options under the consideration of reports, it jumps you to the, to the uh, presentation. Can share my screen if that's helpful, Spencer. Sure, that would be great. So I'll just start. Um, attached to the report, there's four documents that outline options for the McDonald funding of $25,000 that was originally allocated for the sculpture project. Um, Beverly Cairns has been very helpful in assisting with the options. Uh, option one was actually presented by her. Um, so the first option would be um, to commission an artist to do an oil portrait of Mr. McDonald. Uh, Beverly has contacted Laurie McGraw from Guelph, who provide us with some details. Uh, the portrait could be done using the most recent photo of Mr. Uh, Mr. McDonald without a background for, um, or for an additional fee, the background would include the Allura, um, the Allura municipal building, for example. It doesn't have to be the old lower municipal building, it could be something else, but that was where we ended up with that. So the cost of that would be around $8,000 if we didn't have a background, just the portrait, or if we wanted to add the portrait, it would be $13,000 uh, total, or sorry, the background into the portrait. Uh, that would be approximately 20, by 20 inches by 24 inches. And the thought would be that um, the, the idea in option one was that the remainder, so if you look at the, maybe you could skip to the next slide there. Um, that's an example of the style of portrait we're talking about. Um, and then if you skip to the next slide, that is, the, so this is option 1B essentially, 
that with the remainder of the funding, we could uh, we could use it to purchase an existing sculpture, such as the young girl skipping, which is shown here, um, which um, uh, the relation there is that Mr. McDonald donated $75 million to the Seattle Children's Research Institute for Pediatric Research um, Worldwide, which uh, ties in nicely to his legacy. Um, that is option one. Option two is the idea of commissioning an artist to do a bust of Mr. McDonald, similar to the one in this photo here. Uh, that actually lives in the uh, tourism office downstairs. Um, the bust could be installed in the municipal building at one McDonald's Square, and behind the bust, we could put the storyboard, which is already completed, which is in slide three, uh, or sorry, the next slide over, um, which uh, is the who, who was Jack, Jack R. McDonald um, uh, plaque. Uh, if there's still funding available, then perhaps we could consider uh, purchasing the sculpture of the young girl skipping to, to, put, uh, to put in town. The next thing, um, uh, option three, which Dorothy wanted me to put out to everybody was, uh, if there was any ideas from the committee members, we could consider uh, any other ideas. Um, and then option four is we relocate, or reallocate, sorry, the $25,000 to a completely different project. Um, and yeah, so I guess at this time, we want probably to open, open it to the floor to see if anybody, what people's comments are on these ideas and see where, where the consensus is. Okay, well, we've, we've come back to our old friend, the sculpture project. Um, who'd, like to, who'd like to offer some commentary right from the get-go? Grace has her hand up. Yeah, and Jennifer, go ahead, Grace. Okay, um, just a question. First of all, um, is there uh, a possibility of the bust being at the bridge? I'm just wondering if the municipal building, whether it would be seen by enough people and since it, the bridge is connected to him and also the, the little plaque or the plaque about him, is there a possibility of those both of those things by being by the bridge, just curious. Pat? Yeah, Pat, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, that's the first time we've had that suggestion, Grace. So we would just have to take that back and consider where it may or may not fit there, um, how it would have to be protected weather-wise and from vandalism, but a, a great suggestion as another option for sure. Yes. Okay. So we just have to I, take a look at that. Because I was just thinking that more people would see it that way. Um, I mean, I don't know how I feel about a bust anyway. I mean, if you've seen one bust, you've seen them all. So it's not really exciting. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess it depends what kind of bust. But anyway, um, <laughs> I yeah, so I it doesn't really excite me. But um, if it were by the bridge, I would find it a little more interesting idea than if it were in the municipal building. Um, if it were between the, um, the two ideas of the painting and the bust, I almost think there's more life in the painting, um, even if it was in the municipal building. Um, I'd probably tend to, I, I really like the idea of the little girl skipping because that's a, 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 a unique sculpture. You know, the, the painting, it's, you know, would it catch anyone's eye? I don't know, the bust, like I say, they're sort of all, I don't want to say the same because I'm not. And of course, it's great talent that produces it. Whereas if we were to do the, the little girl, I, I think that's a good idea. And it does reflect his interest. Um, I'd probably be for sort of doing a couple of sculptures um, that weren't a bust or a painting around town instead of those two suggestions. But I'd be OK with the others as well. Jennifer, you you were you had your hand up before. Yeah, um, I too like the idea of the the young girl skipping being placed out in the community as a sculpture um, to represent his legacy and his philanthropy and everything like that. 
mean the non-artists. I actually think of a bust as something that's done for a very important person, not just really anyone, but someone really important, like in the community or or elsewhere. So I actually kind of like that idea. I think you know if you're in if you're new or there are times where you do go through that municipal center. And so I thought that would be a really good um, kind of like installed with a storyboard, um, like who he is. Um, I really liked the option too, definitely with the addition of the young girls skipping. So you have something kind of like inside at the municipal um, place, but as well, you have like a representation of him out in the community as well. I just jump in for one sec. Other thoughts? Spencer? Yeah, so I didn't, I think I skipped, sure. but uh, just as a as an added information, so the, the bus would be about $15,000 uh, to be finished in bronze. And then we would have to purchase a stand or whatever the whatever it sits on separately, have it made or, or whatnot. And then um, the, the, um, the sculpture is priced at about $6,000. So if we were to do both, it would actually put us slightly over, it could put us over uh, what our budget is. We, we have to still get that information though. So just so everybody knows, that's all. Thank you. And a, another thought is that rather than the bust, if, if we were going to have somebody of the quality of uh, uh, Lori doing a painting, uh, that, that would be an ideal thing to put in a municipal building. Um, but I, I, I personally like the idea of the Skipping Girl sculpture as a, as a tribute to him or something similar. Other thoughts? I'll throw my two cents worth in, Brian. <clears throat> the only, um, my only thoughts Great, on- Great, thanks, Neil. My only thoughts on- uh, putting a painting in a municipal office is the municipal office is open Monday to Friday um, until five o'clock and, and our tourism comes, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And if we're trying to pay tribute to an individual who did so much for this community, we might want to put it in a more public place that people who visit can understand what he's done for the community. So that's my only thought is I'd, I would really like to see something done. And I, I like the idea of the bus and I like the idea of the skipping girl, but I'd, I'd like it to be somewhere in and around the downtown core where people can see it and understand what he did for our community. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was thinking if we commissioned a painting, a painting could also be turned into that same placking material. Uh, there aren't too many places you can hang an oil painting or a, or a watercolor or acrylic or whatever in a, in a public domain that isn't inside a building. But uh, alongside, alongside the plaque, uh, we could also have uh, a, a rent, like, I'm, I'm, help me Grace, what, what's the process called? Where you take a, they would, they would do a photo of the painting. If we wanna have the painting, we could make better use of it than but I'm not sure it could be outdoors, but I'm, right. well, I'm um, just throwing are, it out there. Um, the artist in Paul Moran, I think is his name in, um, he used to be with Acton Studio, the big, big studio there. He's been, I've been seeing him post images of paintings that he's done that he has finished somehow so they can go outside. So I'm not sure just what it's called, but there are ways of doing that. So there could be, like you say, if it were in the municipal building, if we could afford to do the portrait that went in the municipal building, forget about the background and put the money um, that we save on the background into uh, an image that we could go outside by the plaque, by the bridge. That would be another option. And, and get the girl. We have mm -hmm. to have the girl. <laughs> I, I agree, Pat. I'm going to uh, throw another idea out. Obviously, these are all good. We have a little, this conversation gives staff an opportunity to go back and do some more research. Lots of good ideas floated around here. Um, we are about to embark on a renovation at the Laura Community Centre. And so that's another location. These are smaller installations than what we had originally talked about. 
And I am thinking of an indoor or outdoor space there that could be utilized for the little sculpture and maybe a painting slash plaque or bust and slash plaque. The reason I'm suggesting that is he does have a link to the Allura Community Center as well. And this is supposed to be an Allura installation. I prefer an indoor site for things like a painting and stuff. I just see the worst in our community, unfortunately, at some times when we see graffiti hmm. or uh, vandalism. And um, my fear of putting it somewhere outside, it, it's not a large sculpture like the tall man, which you know anybody playing with that, we would easily see. Um, something small like this could be you know, easily damaged. So I'm gonna throw those out as ideas that I hadn't really thought of the Lower Community Center prior to tonight, but um, something to consider. And we of course can bring back uh, more information for the next meeting. Okay, so we have we have ideas there. Do we want to defer until until the next meeting to discussing about sort of the, the we, I guess there are two issues: the durability of the of whatever outcome we have, and and the location, which is kind of back to where we were in the in the first place. But uh, uh, I think we're beginning to have a bit of consensus about what we like, and uh, so now we just have to solve the those two problems and. Uh, we can go from there. Do, how big actually, does anyone, or, or Spencer, maybe you know, how big is that sculpture? Not, not the bust, I mean the skipping yeah. girl. Oh, the skipping girl? Um, it doesn't say, um, I'd say by the look of it, I would guess it's, you know, two and a half feet tall. I don't think it's, I don't think it's incredibly large. But it could be a nice, um, a nice addition to a, a garden or or something like that. It looks like it's on a solid base. I, I don't know if the base comes with it. Do you know? Right. Grace? Grace has her hand up, Ryan. Just so you know. Uh, I was just thinking. I mean, I think the the sculpture yeah, just... project puts the base up. But as far as the concerns about. Um, damage it's a bronze sculpture so a little i mean it could be damaged but it's pretty pretty tough too um and it could go like you were saying near a, a children's playground at the community center or something that is not a bad idea but i agree with the painting idea you know the duplication that would probably get damaged that's i i take back any enthusiasm about that <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we can just have a consensus here. If it seems like, um, and maybe go around, sorry, I'm speaking out of turn, Brian. I was just oh, trying ahead. to, uh, from a staff perspective, we need a little bit more direction, I think, so we can get some pricing done and, and uh, sol solidify some of these thoughts. There seems to be a lot of consensus uh, um, and positive energy around the skipping girl and telling the story mm -hmm. of Jack R. McDonald along with that. And if we were to sort of focus on that get all the pricing for a stand, consider a location um, that would be suitable in at the grounds or near the entrance of the Laura Community Center, somewhere where children um, participate in recreation in Alora, um, then maybe, you know, we can take that back as direction. If there's also energy around the other ones, I guess I'm sort of wondering, is it the photo or is it the bust? And uh, they're very different prices, uh, not the photo, sorry, the painting or the bust. Is there a particular um, energy around it or should we just focus on one uh, piece that everyone feels strongly about? Just looking for some to narrow our, our research down. Do we want to do a straw poll about the painting versus the bust? Just leaving aside the, sculpt, the girl skipping sculpture for a second. Go ahead, Pat. Or just go around uh, and Pat, hear from the ahead. committee. Yes, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, just go around and ask each committee member what their preference is. And uh, that will give us a, a strong uh, feel for the direction. And if everybody wants us to look into all three options, we can do that as well. And just, uh, you know, what do you think of the location and what do you think of each of the options or do you want to consider a different one? If we could do that, Brian, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, let's start with Dean.
Sorry, I was just minimized. Still there? there. Well, um, yeah, I just found my unmute button. Yeah, I uh, I don't have. Uh, I think they're all good ideas. I do like uh, Pat's last suggestion about the tie-ins that of uh, McDonald funding that's that's gone towards the Alora Community Center as as a potential good location for or something of mention to Jack McDonald. Um, it's. I don't have any direct preference on which is best. I think they're all good ideas. I don't see anything as as one that doesn't is any better than the other. So I don't have major input either way. Uh, Grace? I think that I would go for the painting partially because the price of the bust would get too high by the time you get the um, the base. I'd be fine with the bust if it was in front of the bridge, but I, if it were in the municipal building, I would prefer the painting, um, probably with no background to give us a little playroom with money. Uh, the, the bust the, would get too pricey. And, and in addition, the sculpture, the, sorry, the uh, skipping girl. Oh, I, we're yeah, just, I love We'll just concentrate on the, on the, yeah, the two options. Y yes. Okay. Skip, okay we'll, thanks, we'll, Grace. Jen? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think if the bust is going to leave us, if there's going to be an issue with budget, then I would go back to the painting um, with the focus on the skipping girl. Okay, Kim, Kim. I love the skipping girl and I'm not, I'm not partial to a bust idea. I'm thinking kind of for the flow and feel of Alora where I just, I think more of a painting would suit what Alora kind of goes for. Um, but then I was also wondering, cause it wasn't Alora sculpture projects idea originally instead of doing like a bust or a painting is there could you do multiple sculptures like the skipping girl and a couple other sculptures that mm -hmm. the sculpture project really liked to have and that they wanted to keep in the co community like over the years or something to get back so then there could be all like three different sculptures around little plaques dedicated back to his memory or something along that line and they could be done in the gardens so then one could be at the community center one could be downtown one can be out by the allura center for the arts or bissell park or something just an idea kind of spread the wealth around contribute to various artists and also it would be because it was the allura sculpture projects project to start with then it would be something that would signify to them that we we liked their idea it was just too bad that it didn't kind of work out the way it was supposed to but if they wanted sculptures brought to the community permanently we could do that for them i don't know okay that's that's good thanks thanks kim um kurt um so first of all yeah with the skipping girl um i I think it fits the spirit of, of the uh, of the Jack McDonald funding and the projects that came forward because it's about the community and it's about um, recreation and fun and involvement. So I like that idea because it fits the spirit of of what what the funding was about. And then I think about the Buster, the painting. That's kind of an exact representation of Jack McDonald in. in what did what would the purpose of that be it would be to honor him but hearing kim's comments can we do that in a better way um staying with the spirit of of all of these funds that came to us and and look at other sculptures so so not that exact piece we can still tell the jack mcdonald story um but represent it in a, in a more create creative way okay Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Neil, did you want to give us your comment? Uh, no, I think I agree with most of the people that the skipping girl is is fine. Um, I would have been okay with the painting, but if we want to look at other sculptures, I think if, maybe if staff priced that up for us, I'd be interested to see what we get for the twenty five thousand that's there. But I'm okay putting a painting in the 
in a building and uh, the skipping girl somewhere else. Just make sure it's a building that has lots of hours on weekends so that we're, we're not eliminating <laughs> people. Okay. So this conversation raises a couple of questions uh, in the spirit of what we did before, what we originally started with. Uh, is the skipping girl by somebody local? Do you know that, Grace? I actually, I don't know. I'm just looking at it here and I don't remember who it's by. I don't know. Is, let, but maybe let, in this case, it doesn't matter. It has been in Alora. Um, so it was somebody that did submit to the Laura Sculpture Project. I mean, I, I appreciate that it maybe it would be nice to be local, but it has been here for, you know, all summer or whenever it was here. Okay. So I don't know. If, if we took, that's going, that's selling for six. If we say we bought a couple of more sculptures around the same price, are they existing sculptures? Are they... Uh, local sculptures? Is it a competition? But I'm I'm just thinking of the political ramifications, and so I just I throw that out there too. I'm I'm I like I personally my 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 vote would be let's buy some sculptures and have a, something on them that says that they came from the Jack McDonald Fund and they're in honor of him. I think that's a wonderful solution to the whole thing. But yeah, our, the the rest is just details. But I I have to put it out there. What do you think, Pat or Spencer? Kendra had her hand up there for a second. Okay, go for it, Jennifer. Sorry, I know I'm not part of this discussion. I just <laughs> in the past, we've put little like stakes, like bronze stakes next to them where we've had some information and maybe there's a possibility we could do a QR code or something to more information where we could have a storyboard or something. I'm just trying to think of other ways where we can make sure that the story behind um, Mr. McDonald comes through versus that it's just another plaque um, because a lot of our tourists won't understand and won't see that correlation. So I'm just trying to think of other ways and I can talk to Spencer about this after as well of how we can just make sure that the story of how he has uh, done so much for our community comes through and not just another sculpture that people will say, oh, that's neat, but not really understand the reasoning behind why we have it. Okay, well, I, th I think it almost goes without saying that any sculpture that's bought with his money should be plaqued in one way or another, uh, but you'd know more about that, Kendra, than is that what you're saying, that it's not enough just to put a sculpture, but it needs to have a it needs to have a, an attribution. Yeah, like we can, um, you know, if we're gonna do several is what I'm saying. It gets hard if you're gonna put more around to get that story out rather than, because if we're gonna do more, you're gonna have to do them smaller. Um, so I'm just trying to think of, you know, and Spencer and I can work on that too, of how we can make sure that people can follow that story and get information about it. Um, if we're gonna do that way versus one, because when you do one, then you can put that, information there and people see it and then they move on. Um, but if you're going to do a few little things, then I just want to make sure that it gets out and we can communicate that properly. Okay. Jennifer, I think you were, thanks, Kendra. I think you were back there, Jennifer. We, we missed you, your picture, you disappeared. Um, yeah, I shut it off for a moment, but um, yeah, no, I, like I said, I was leading towards the portrait as well but I'm definitely I think if there was more sculptures if we were able to add in that and I think yeah um I'm, I'm I'm good with any of those suggestions I think they're all great options okay Pat your hand was up um I I will give Spence to the last word of course it's <laughs> that will do the work, but I think we've got a lot of direction here and we can come back with some more suggestions, a little firmer pricing, uh, location options, um, and allow this committee again to review considerations. But Spencer, I feel you've listened to the conversation. You have a bit more information. The sculpture seems to be the number one, uh, the skipping girl seems to be the number one priority. So we would have to price 
everything out for it and then know what we have left and what we can consider, whether it's the painting or additional sculptures, which is uh, we have to talk about locations and um, talk to the Laura Sculpture Committee um, to understand what they um, would have available. So uh, if you're comfortable, Spencer, with uh, the direction and information you received right now, then we can uh, move on on the agenda with direction to bring back more information at uh, a future meeting, maybe the next meeting, if we can get as much done as we hope. Yep, I've been um, I've been taking notes. I have uh, I can circle back with Dorothy, and we can go over everything and um, uh, and come back with more info. I also just so everybody knows, I did I was able to find the name of the artist is Tim Dolman, um, and it, I I can't find anything about him, but it says he's a frequent contributor to the Alora Sculpture Project. I found a post from twenty sixteen or twenty fifteen, so. Uh, and I think this sculpture was used in 2018. So um, yeah, I don't know if anybody knows him, but I'll, I'll keep going down that trail to, to figure out where he's from and get some more info. Okay. But yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, so we'll leave it with you, Spencer, for now and uh, possibly hear from you at the next meeting. Sounds great. Or, or whenever you're comfortable coming back to us. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. All right, thank uh, you. Shall we move along then to to Kendra, and you're going to update us on the Neighborhood Wellness Project. Perfect, uh, Devlin, I don't know if you can pull up the, um, the grant for me and we can go through it. Okay, so I was asked to come back to this committee with um, an example of what the grant program could look like. Um, for consideration and input. And then from here, I will take everyone's consideration and input and then put it into a revised document and bring forward to council so that hopefully um, in 2022, we can get rolling with this program. Um, so I know I've been to this committee before and went through this. Um, just a quick update. Uh, the goal of this grant is to bring neighborhoods together and support wellness and connectivity through our community. Um, they'll be made available as small grants between $1,000 and $3,000 to resident-led groups um, to inspire their neighborhoods with events held between February 1st and November 30th of next year. Um, I just went through um, just kind of giving eligibility information. So who's eligible? Um, so these groups must be a resident-led community group. We don't want businesses, social enterprises, or incorporated nonprofit groups coming forward for these. Um, and we want the resident group to reside in Center Wellington. Um, we just kind of put some um, information around it. So we want to make sure that people are planning events that take place in the community that are free and open to residents in the neighborhood. We don't want them to be fundraisers. Um, we want it to benefit township citizens. Um, again, the dates um, to make sure that it's a one-time event or activity and that it's held in a public space. So um, a neighborhood park. Um, again, we had talked about if someone wanted to close down a portion of their street, uh, something along that lines. We just don't want someone um, planning a pool party in their backyard and then bringing on that liability. Um, we go through a little part in here about getting a permit and insurance. Um, so we will need people to get a permit for township owned space. Um, and then the cost must be included in the budget request that we asked them to fill out. Um, and then on the web page, I'll put more information on that for, um, for residents to look at. The next page, Devlin. Um, so here just goes through some of the requirements. So um, we just want people to understand that it is tax supported dollars. So we want everyone to be responsible um, and understand that the event that they're holding um, needs to be accounted for. And so we are going to be requiring them to bring their receipts and everything back to township so that we can go through them and make sure that they're appropriate. Um, we then um, go through the eligible expenses. So advertising and promotion, um, the permits, liability insurance, uh, dedicated space rental or permit fees, um, printing. So if they wanna do posters or flyers or put things in people's mailboxes to get them out to the neighborhood event, um, project materials and supplies, uh, food for participants, and then volunteer expenses. Um, and we just put a maximum of $50 so that we don't have people spending majority of it on a certain activity or food item. Um, purchase of art supplies or sporting equipment, and then rental fees if they have to do anything like that. 
um, ineligible, we've listed um, alcohol, uh, fundraising, activities, events, or donations to charities, um, ongoing projects or programs. We want this to be a one-time event. Uh, cost to maintain activities beyond the funding term won't be eligible. The salaries and hourly wages, um, anything income generating would not be eligible. Uh, fees paid to project partners, um, activities in travel outside of Centre Wellington. Again, this is a neighbourhood wellness piece, so we want to make sure that it takes place in Centre Wellington. Uh, purchase of media equipment, so we don't want people buying computers, laptops, televisions, things like that, um, or barbecues to host the barbecue with. Um, activities related to religious and or political purposes and events or programs that already receive other subsidies from the township. Uh, next page. Um, so, and also, sorry, capital projects and the event activity budget. So um, we are going to be asking anyone that applies to fill out a budget and then that making sure that it goes between the thousand and three thousand dollar maximum. Um, we want them to understand the process and how um, they're going to be able to fit everything they want into that process. Um, we want them to list as many details as possible in the form um, so that we can, when we're going through the grant application process, make sure that everything is detailed and they understand where the money is going to be going. Um, and then how to apply. So they must apply online only. Um, there's a link. So once the web page is built, then there'll be a link to the form. And if they need any help with filling out the form or any questions or information like that, they're always welcome to contact me and I can go through it with them. So that's kind of the gist of the, um, of the kind of requirements around it. The form will be attached to that. And then that's what they'll fill out and it will come to myself. And then we can go through as a group, um, similar to what I believe you do with Dorothy for the community impact grants. And then we can together um, issue those uh, wellness grants out to the community. And I'm open to any questions. That's great. Thanks, Kendra. Please, anyone have questions or comments at this stage? I'm not seeing any hands. May I ask a question then? Uh, I'll just throw this out. Do, is there an overall budget for this or is it, or is it uh, a kind of, let's wait and see what, what kind of applications we get? Um, I'll that's I'll, addressed to you, Kendra. Yeah, I'm not sure if Pat, has um, the final. I, I thought it was about $15,000, but I'm not quite sure. Pat? Uh, we can definitely get back to you for sure on that, Brian. I'd have to speak to finance, but if you remember, um, there was a, a surplus of McDonald's, uh, sorry, of computer, community impact grant funding at the end mm -hmm. of um, 20, uh, 21's allocations. And uh, it was sort of suggested and requested the council, and I think Neil can attest to this, that that money was then put into a reserve for a program like this, but we didn't sure. know the details. So the dollar amount I cannot give you yet, but I believe um, it's over, I wanna say it's closer to 26,000. I'm not sure why that number is sticking in my head, um, but we had to wait until all of the other grants were processed and then it was the balance that was left that was put aside. So if council agrees to this program, that would be part of their directive to formally allocate those funds, all of those funds to uh, distribute through this program they may want to separate it uh, into years um, so that some is in 2022, some is in 2023. But um, I, I would love to hear from um, anyone else who has thoughts on that. But the idea is to get after COVID uh, sort of a, a regeneration of uh, uh, the communities gathering and supporting each other through na this neighborhood wellness program. So we don't want this to um, drag on too long. We want to get that money out there in 2022, maybe 2023, but I'll, um, I'll defer to anyone else who has other details on that. But that's what I remember. Kim, I think you had a question. Oh, I did. Um, so Kendra, are you saying that once they submit in to you, then you're going to bring the applications to us for approval? Yeah, we were going, like that was what the direction was from council is that they wanted either a committee 
or for it to go back to someone to decide. I mean, it wouldn't just be myself that goes to them. So my understanding from council was that once the um, applications came in, that they would come back to CSAC and then we would go through them and make sure that they were within that funding guideline um, and then make sure that all the dollars were spent accordingly and then give them out to the various groups. Someone might just come for $1,000, some might come for $3,000. So I think it was just based on how many we got um, in the next couple months or when this is launched. Uh, and these dates might fluctuate. I put the February to November in, but we may not go back to council with this, let's say until end of October or even November. And then we would just, you know, kind of offset those dates based on that, so. Okay, because do they have to, um, so was there an application by date? Like, did they have? Is, yeah, I have to go to council. And so I'm just going to make sure that once I know the dates that this is going, which I believe we're going to try and go at the end of October, then once I have that firmed and the dollars allocated to all of this, then I can put everything all together and then be able to put the appropriate dates on that. And I can come back to the next meeting with those dates. Oh, okay. All right. I was just worried if we have to do the events, like when we're not sitting, like if somebody needs approval and it's July, so... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, I think the goal would be that we would ask for all the applications to come in by a certain date and then we would go through everything similar to the community impact grants. So it's not just one-offs or, you know, impeding on summer vacations or times when the committee's oh. meeting or anything like that. I would hate to put all of that on you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Pat? Your hand was up. Actually, Kendra just answered, uh, clarified my question. So okay. I don't need to say anything. Right. Jennifer has her hand up. She's been sitting there patiently, Brian. Yeah, I see her. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, Kendra, just two quick questions. I was curious about how much the permit would be that they would need to get, just to see how much that would take up of the budget. I'm not familiar. And then I'm also curious if there would be any guidance to, um, like on the communication or marketing of the event of like how they would make their area aware, like, you know, um, whether this is something like, hey, can we have like a toboggan party at like the Alora soccer fields? And like, you know, you're posting it on Facebook everywhere, or if it's supposed to be like a smaller, like get to know your neighbors, like knock on some doors put together, kind of an application, just kind of more maybe guidance on how to communicate and uh, market the event. So um, great questions. Um, I think that uh, permits, I'd have to check with Pat, but I know that in the past when we were doing permits for uh, yoga in the park and things like that, I think it was a minimal cost, like $15. It's more so that we just know that those events are happening and that we can make sure that the proper um, you know, that they have all that insurance so that if there was anything that went wrong or um, if someone got hurt or anything like that, then they understand uh, all of that liability behind that. Um, in terms of um, marketing and promotions, yeah, as soon as we have the dates and everything, it's going to be like a really fun marketing campaign and it's really going to be up to the neighborhood. So, you know, what brings that neighborhood together? Maybe it's that it's a newer neighborhood where not a lot of people know each other, a lot of families. So then the whole get let's get together and go to the arena and do a skating party or, you know, or go outside or, you know, something like that, then that would be more fitting for that group. Or maybe it's just, you know, an outside um, street party with a barbecue for an older, more established um, neighborhood where they kind of know their neighbors, but it's just a way that you haven't seen them in 18 months and you just want to go out and say hi safely. And you feel like, you know, in the summer, next summer of, you know, 2022, that that's, you know, it's time that we can get out there and see everyone more safely. And we just want to get in touch with them and have a little barbecue on the street and, uh, and rem remember why you love living in center Wellington and in that community. So it's really going to range based on the neighborhood. Um, for sure. I'm going to, you know, put out some examples of what I know other municipalities have done. Um, and, you know, a little bit of options and ideas, but at the end of the day, I think everyone knows their neighborhood best and they know what they're capable of pulling off or not pulling off. And so I really want, 
I really want it to be more of an organic thing where people are coming up with their own ideas and then um, showing them back to us. I think that's really important. And a fun part of this is that when the event is over, I really want them to share the photos on social media and we can get the information out there so that it inspires other neighborhoods to do the same thing. Neil. Yeah, and just a couple of things that have been kicked around. Pat, I think you're right with your numbers. In my head says between 20 and 25 was what I thought. But we'd have to go back to the budget book and have a look at, at what was left over. Um, so nobody quote me on those hard numbers until somebody looks at the budget book, please. But I think it, it came back from council to this committee because it, there is a limited amount of money and we have no idea when this goes forward how many applications are gonna come out. And so we'd like this committee to look at those applications. So Kendra, we might try to find, I don't know if it's a first come first serve when you, you uh, finally put this in. So we put a date and a deadline and we need to make sure that the public knows that that deadline is a deadline. So if it comes in the day after, guess what? There's not, a, not an endless supply here. So that deadline is a deadline. So get in and just because you're in doesn't mean uh, you're getting it. This committee will have to review it. And so we'd have to have a criteria to look at. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you score them? You know, they, we've, we've gone through that with other grants that have been here. So if there's a thought in your head about that, or if you can think about that, uh, you know, how we would decide who, which, which event is better than another, or if we just say it's the first, you know, until the money's gone, but it's first come first serve. So those are the things that I would think if I was voting on this account, I'd want answers to. Anyone want to comment on that? That's Kurt. I, actually, I, I don't. I entirely agree with what Neil said, and yeah, we have to be really careful in terms of of, of the criteria and making it clear how people um, can be successful for getting the funding. I just had a specific question around um, the outline. Uh, ineligible, I'm just trying to picture what some ideas could be as far as what what uh, neighborhoods would do. Uh, under ineligible expenses, it said fees paid to project partners. What, um, just what might that be an example of? Or if you're having anybody in, they're, they're, part of your expenses can't cannot be fees paid to anyone, Kendra? Yeah, I think it was more about partnerships. So let's say um, you knew someone that, um, you know, was involved in promoting something. Um, we just don't want you to bring on those kind of second or third parties that would then promote your event or, um, you know, take those dollars and not invest, but just kind of move it along. We really want this to be a grassroots um, project. And so we just don't want like paying of people like or third parties just to kind of bring those things to the next level because we really just want it to be about um, bringing neighborhoods together and letting them do that work. Okay. Anyone else? Pat? Yeah, Matt would know better, but... <laughs> um, what, uh, what we're talking about with permit fees is completely dependent on what they want to rent. So they might want to rent Beldwood Hall, which has a rates and fees schedule. They may want to use a soccer field, which has a rates and fees schedule. It could be parks open space. I think what the township would do is charge the permit fee and then, but if let's say they need to close a road, there are expenses associated with that. And we have rates and fees for doing that as well. So those are the types of permit fees we're talking about so that the um, event is covered uh, from a uh, facility basis. It's not a, a permit fee to get to apply. It's not like a permit fee like you would do, I'm applying for a um, dog license or something. It is actually a permit to use space. Um, and if your space has no expense for, um, with it, then there is no permit fee but there could be a permit required, which is a no fee permit, just like we said. So we're aware it's happening. And uh, if we have to drop off an extra garbage pail or something like that for that event, we're aware of it from the parks department. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add, Matt. No, I, I was gonna add that. So, you know, biggest thing is we know about the event and, you know, if we need extra garbage cans or, or picnic tables, um, you know, our department loves to help out with that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, that's, Pat, you nailed it all.
Neil, you know, were you suggesting that uh, we should now or at a later meeting make a decision about the priority of given, in other words, first come, first serve, or judging the, um, the nature of the applications? Is that something we should do, you want us to be thinking about? Or I do don't we? think so. I think I'd rather have staff that look at that because they've got other grants and stuff that they have criteria for, and, and maybe Kendra can work with the, the Parks and Rec staff and figure that out. Because there's, you know, we've already done that in several different ways, and there's no sense in reinventing the horse here because we'll come up with about a dozen ideas or so. So I, I kind of let them bring that back to us in another meeting. Okay, that's great. Any, Pat? So Kendra, just summarize for us then your next steps and uh, the role CSAC will play um, so that everybody walks away from this meeting. This isn't something we're voting on. We've provided, um, this team has provided uh, feedback to you and uh, what they support with this program. So just a remind us again, your next steps, because ultimately this is a council driven program and uh, their authority here, but they've asked us for um, uh, input, correct? Yeah, so my understanding was that I will bring this back to council, um, hopefully in October, depending on the um, on the number of projects already on that list for this month. But hopefully I'll get back in October. I'll present this to them. Pending everything is approved and they're happy with everything. I'll start building the web page and all of the information in the forms so that we can get that up and going on Connect CW and then start a marketing campaign around that, which will be um, just making sure that on the radio and through social media and the paper and that they're all in a media release that everyone is aware that this project is now coming and that they can start thinking about safely returning to get together with their family or their neighbors and um, getting you know out in the community and starting these programs. So that will be the next step. And then I will, um, it's up to you if you want me to come to the November meeting with how council has, um, has directed this. Um, I can by all means, or I can just kind of send an update like an information item to, um, to include in your meeting, but I don't mind either way. And then um, it would be that that promotion would start and then we would finalize the dates and then get people um, ready to submit by uh, February or March. Okay, that's great. Kendra, thanks so much. Great, great information. We'll look forward to hearing more about it and uh, getting this underway. Thank you, everyone. Now, moving on, um, the next item, and I, I, uh, is this Matt that's going to present this, or Pat, it's about the uh, return to use for the ice rink. Matt? Yeah, that's going to be me. Um, yeah, so, hey, we're open for business in uh, Parks and Rec, with, of course, uh, the Ontario government's um, restrictions or regulations. So <laughs> we're working away um, at opening our facilities. So just to give you a quick update, um, um, we've worked on strategies for reopening for um, both our rec centers, as well as our uh, senior center and uh, theater. Uh, both the theater and uh, senior center have just recently opened. Um, so um, I think with the senior center, um, things are going well. They're, they're, um, they were hoping for more in-person activity, but um, it's been slow this past week and we're hoping to, to ramp that up. Um, at, down at the theater, Eric um, is sitting in the box office this week and uh, he's preparing um, shows and, and uh, getting that theater ready for use. So um, that's, that's a good thing. Um, what um, I'd just like to share with um, the committee today is just, um, our ice rink return to play. It um, it's, uh, has been um, a tough go the past little bit for staff, but um, I think we've got things working. And you know, for the most part, kids and parents are happy to be back um, in our facilities and back on the ice. So we do, um, but before everyone started to come to play, we. We had to talk and sit down with sports groups and ice rental uh, groups returning. And uh, we asked them to put together 
um, a return to play document. And um, basically with, um, with that return to play, they needed um, to understand um, the uh, guideline, or sorry, the internal regulations, and um, just um, what um, what they need to follow to come back. So basically, we uh, we put this document together um, to, as a guideline for groups um, to follow when they come into our arenas. So. Um, it's been going well. We've also, we, we've, um, in order to help some of these groups back, like private rentals and whatnot, we've, we've also put a template together uh, to help them with their return to play. So that, uh, that has been fairly successful. Um, so basically, um, just to give a quick overview, when, when the ICE users and spectators are coming into our facilities, um, for the most part, they're going to be greeted by a third uh, party um, security company. And at that point, uh, people must screen and um, uh, for contract tracing purposes, as well as show proof of being double vaccinated um, to enter into our facilities. Um, with um, the security guards, uh, it, it uh, has been quite helpful. Um, you know, they're trained on how to deal with conflict. Um, I know there has been a couple incidents where um, staff have been at the front um, taking care of it, and um, it's it has put them in, in tough situations. And uh, you know, some staff feel comfortable with uh, that type of conflict, and others don't. So um, I'm quite happy that we've pushed ahead with the security company and um, talking with other um, municipalities as well as the security company we're using, there's um, a lot more municipalities going the same route uh, that uh, we've chosen. So um, it's so far that has been, um, it has been successful. Um, just, um, just wanted just to share too, like there, there's some except, um, exceptions. I know um, we're saying that uh, everyone has to be double vaccinated. Uh, to come in, or sorry, the Ontario government is telling us that everyone has to be double vaccinated to come in. But so there are some uh, exemptions, and it's children under the age of 12 are exempt, um, but they also still must screen to come in. Um, and also youth ages 12 to 17 participating in organized sports are not required um, proof of vaccination. Um, just uh, there... So that's basically we we are just following the Ontario um, regulations to allow people into our building. So, um, as an example, uh, minor hockey, uh, their um, their association has went above and beyond, and they're requiring their participants ages twelve to seventeen to be vaccinated to play minor hockey. Um, but that's not something that we're, we are addressing at the door. That's something above and beyond what the Ontario government is asking. So we're, um, we will not be um, stopping people for that, uh, for the OMHA's rules. Um, also, there's also um, ex uh, exemptions for people that uh, will provide a medical note and uh, that, uh, that's provided in the Ontario regs that um, is part of this package as well. Um, other items um, in our return to play document consists of dressing room, ice surface and spectator capacity. So um, we've just sort of set um, these limits out to our user groups and uh, they're the ones that are, are really policing and, and patrolling um, those guidelines that were set up by the government um, they're really policing um, how many people can be in a dressing room at a time. Like we've, we've put the limits. Um, it's, it's been difficult, um, but, um, you know, the groups are amazing. They're making it work. It's, uh, it's great to see. There's, it's nice to see some happy faces coming in and uh, get back playing. And, uh, you know, even seeing the parents back together, they're, they're you can tell. Um, for the most part, um, we've got these restrictions, but uh, people are, are happy coming back to play. Um, so another uh, just section of this, um, shortly after 
this new regulation was updated, um, Dr. Mercer issued a letter of instruction regarding proof of vaccination requirements for persons entering facilities used for sports and recreation activity, activities. Um, so basically this was issued because there was a bit of a gray area in the Ontario regulations that dealt with volunteers and coaches. And it really didn't specify if volunteers and coaches needed to be um, vaccinated. Um, so with Dr. Mercer's order, she's instructed basically that all people 12 years or older who support organized sport must be double vaccinated to enter our facilities. So um, that, um, that goes across the board. So that, that'll, that'll be uh, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph. Um, uh, to this date, I think that's the only um, health unit that I'm aware of that um, has ordered that issue. Or yes, yeah, so that um, it had, it, it actually that um, order it, it did help the um, the sports groups because they were coming back to us and um, saying okay well how you know how can we get our volunteers in well these volunteers don't have to be vaccinated they can coach so it really um, by her putting that order out it's um, it's just made the rules a lot easier for for the sports groups pushing forward to to run their activities. Um, does anybody have any questions on on uh, the ice opening? Or, um, or um, the updated um, order from Dr. Mercer. Um, again, it's it's all in um, it's all in the package here. And yeah, if you've got uh, questions, um, please uh, fire away or, or give me an email later. Matt, I just said um, as you're talking that it sounds like things are operating real well there. What's your standpoint with the pool? I see the pool is open and operating, so you're allowing young people to get in and, and use the aquatic center as well, I see. Yes, that's, um, that's going well, Dean. Um, right now, a lot of lane swims, um, um, aquafit and thera therapeutic swims. And again, it's, um, they have to pre-register before um, uh, they do come in, but um, same process um, for the swimmers coming into our, um, our facility that uh, they would have to um, scan or self or not self scan but scan. Um, we've got a QR code uh, where people can use their uh, phone, um, and it's uh, it, it's a little e uh, it's a little easier on the phone. But we've also set it up where if um, we have the security guards do the screening as well, if if um, people don't have access to their phone, where um, they would get screened and sign in very similar to a, a restaurant where you sign in uh, going into a store like that. Um, yeah, so they're being double vax, they're, they're checked for double vax and things seem to be running fairly smooth. Um, I, I know we, we've had some incidences um, where we've had people that do not have the double vaccination um, giving staff and uh, security a hard time, but uh, all in all, it has been um, a fairly positive experience, which, which it should be. Um, when, I guess when, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I was just gonna expand on uh, your answer to Dean, which is that it really is anyone entering, whether you're a spectator, a fitness a weight room user, a fitness class participant, a swimmer, everybody has to follow this new procedure. Um, I think our focus was on the ice because that has been the biggest challenge um, with so many people. You know, you don't really have a hundred spectators in the weight room. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge and everybody's been very cooperative. So I just wanna explain anyone entering the facility, whether it's for a meeting or whether it's to come to participate because you're entering that sports and recreation facility, the proof of vaccine um, is required. Neil? Yeah, I just, I just wanna say thank you to Matt and, and to Pat and to your staff, because I know these are not easy times and people are stressed out. And, you know, I've said it before, it's not our law. It, it comes down from the province, but we, we have to follow the law like everybody else and we have to enforce it. And people aren't, uh, always appreciative of that, but we're blessed here in Centre Wellington where we have the vast majority of people who do. 
And I just ask everybody to be patient, but I want to make sure that the staff know that we appreciate uh, the, the stress you're under and the good job that you're doing. So thank you. Thanks. I'm going to add I'll, to I'll that. definitely pass that on to the staff. Um, I, sit, I sit on a number of boards and committees and run, uh, run teams throughout leagues in Ontario. And I've sat in on a number of Zoom meetings and I have spoke very, very highly of our staff and our community that has found a way to bring sport inside to our, to our community where many other centers and other municipalities and cities have not. So kudos to you guys. Um, great job. It, I can see that in the people that are using it and so happy to be inside where earlier in the process, people were not able to use facilities in, in a lot of other places across the province. So good, good on you guys. And I think you guys do have to be acknowledged on the work that you found a way to make sport and make your facilities usable. So anyways, I've spoke highly of you guys on a, on a few different boards. So thank you. Here, here. Any other comments to Matt on this item? Okay. Um, I'm not sure who's speaking to the community impact grant policy changes in, in Dorothy's absence. Is that you, Pat? Go ahead, please. Thanks. I just really wanted to share that. Um, oh, I haven't uh, got the right document open. Ah, just to give me one minute. Um, it closed. It closed all by itself. It was nothing I did. <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, just uh, one of the items that we had at our last previous meeting was a uh, a request uh, for council to consider a recommendation um, on the community impact grant um, terms and conditions. And that was approved by council. So uh, the recommendation that was put forward and all of the changes were adopted by council. So I just wanted to make sure that got back to this group that your hard work was appreciated and um, was moved forward as an item uh, in council. So now those grant applications are uh, we're accepting applications and Dorothy has a schedule of uh, receiving review and those applications um, that qualify will come back to this group uh, to review. So that's where we're at. Great. Thanks, Pat. That's good news. Um, next item is an update on the Healthy Growth Advisory Committee. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm the member representing us. Um, this has been a very busy group. It's divided into subcommittees. We've had meetings all summer long. Um, we're, it's a kind of bipartisan or bipart, bipartite group, which is looking at ways in which Senator Wellington and to some extent in cooperation, uh, Wellington County can provide modifications or, or new approaches to making affordable, not affordable, attainable, there's a difference, although it kind of covers uh, both areas, but basically we're talking about solving a problem that uh, our community and in fact our nation has, which is uh, people of modest income not being able to either find places to buy or rent. Um, so we've been like many, many municipalities across the, the province and the country, we've been looking at what are the tools that could be applied and um, I'm, I'm happy to say that today, the Healthy Growth Committee and its full, full body uh, met uh, and uh, authorized or, or provided a, a report or some recommendations to the to Municipal Council, which Neil, you'll be hearing more about in October. Um, that, and, and, and just in summary, the three, the three areas of activity uh, involve uh, changes to the highway commercial zoning, which would allow for more residential uh, and more specific kinds of residential activity. Uh, the, the second was looking at a, a relatively new tool that the Ontario government has introduced called the community planning permit system, which is a very streamlined way of approaching development. And as we've been told and people are discussing, People who build buildings are looking to find faster ways to get them built uh, or to bring new projects in online. So the CPPS is one of those. So we've recommended that uh, council 
uh, look at this approach and uh, and do do some of the research involved and maybe and go go into that particular area. Um, and the third the third item, which relates to the financial incentives component, is to implement or change uh, our current sorry augment our current community improvement plan, which is called a CIP which is a very specific way of, of dealing with particular issues that need to be modified or changed. And in this case, it's uh, attainable housing in, in its various forms. So we were kind of finally feeling the, that good feeling that uh, people have when they actually make a recommendation and have a, uh, and have a, a kind of body of thought presented. And uh, so we'll see where that goes from here. So that's, it's been a, a very interesting summer with this group. We've learned a lot about municipal planning. We've had guests and we've had uh, uh, conversations that uh, I, I never expected to be having. So it's been, it's been a good thing. Anyone have any questions about the Healthy Growth Committee? Uh, Grace. Uh, just curious if there's been any discussion about any um restrictions on where Airbnb, Airbnbs are, are going to be allowed, because I think Alora is just more and more every day, every available house is being turned into an Airbnb. Any progress on that or any possibility of any shifting? I know it's- I can't, I, it's, it has been discussed uh, at some length and uh, we, we haven't made a particular recommendation, but it's certainly something that has been discussed in, in all its pros and cons, uh, particularly the, the issue of houses being converted to uh, non-residential use, but strictly for uh, short-term short -term rentals, I guess is the right term. So yes, it's, it's, it's on our agenda, uh, but I can't give you a specific, uh, a, specific, a specific response. So an interest, it's an interesting and, and might I say a thorny issue. Challenging, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Grace. Um, so unless there are any, any further questions about that, sorry, I'm just going to have to find my agenda again. It keeps closing up on me. Um, well, Kurt, the, the indoor turf facility. An so I uh, still have nothing to report, but I'm, I'm thinking we're slowly coming back to maybe a bit of normalcy where priority wise, um, I can even just initially check back in with with Pat, reconnect uh, our group with, with some mm -hmm. staff, see if we can um, harken back to the time when we were starting a bit of a plan and see if we can work on some next steps. And I entirely understand, you know, in terms of priorities, it's been a tough year and a half. So those are my thoughts on, uh, on, this, on the spot, but I would hope in the next little bit, we can um, at least uh, slowly get ourselves back into this investigation. Good. That's great. Thanks, Kurt. Appreciate that. Uh, Neil, council update. Yeah, I'll give that. I saw Pat raise her hand about the turf. Pat, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I was just going to echo respond, Kurt. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to echo Kurt's uh, um, comments there. It's probably time that uh, we coordinate at least a touch base meeting with the subcommittee that was uh, starting work on this before COVID hit. Um, there still might not, uh, we have to hire the consultant and then send out the um, request for information through that. So absolutely, let's uh, consider getting together at least to touch base and, and put some new timelines to that project. Yeah, okay. I look forward okay. to that. Council. Back to you, Neil. Nothing happened. We took the summer off, so we can move on. <laughs> um, we're dealing with a lot of things, as you probably read in, in, the, in the press. The, the biggest thing right now is the budget. And, and the, the toughest thing about the budget are the inflation figures and the fact that inflation, you know, is 7.7% for a year and, and gets down up or down to about five and a half uh, for a five-year average. And, and we're trying to keep the tax increase to, to 2.4. So that makes it a very difficult thing. And so staff are working hard and council's giving them direction. So the budget eats up a lot of our time. But I think besides the budget, the, the biggest thing I wanna share with you from council is that uh, CAO uh, Andy Goldie has decided to retire. And so since Andy is leaving after I think 32 years in municipal politics, if I'm not mistaken, and, and that's a, a heck of a career. And I think we're going to miss his leadership and his guidance. And 
So now we're embarking on searching for a new CAO. And so we've started uh, a process for that. We're looking at how we develop a job description for that. And then we, we've uh, decided that we were going to get some help with that. And so we'll see how that process plays out. But that's it, as sad as it is to see somebody go, it's also an exciting time that we get to, to look at somebody else's vision and, and, and somebody else working with council. So um, first thing I wanna make sure is that we congratulate Andy Goldie on the hard work that he's done. And I think this committee is familiar with him. If anybody's been on the committee for a long time, he started as Parks and Rec director here. So his, his, uh, his fingerprints are all over Parks and Rec. And so, you know, I think, uh, I think it's been a great career and I, I think he's got, he leaves uh, big shoes to fill. So I think that's kind of where we're focusing on this. We'll get through the budget, we'll get through that and, uh, and we'll see what comes out. So that's pretty much all I've got for you today, Brian. Great. Thanks so much, Neil. Appreciate your comments on, uh, on Andy. Um, next item, I guess we're back to you, Matt, parks and facilities. Sounds good. I, yeah, no, I've got a couple of things to update. Um, just with the um, Laura Community Center project, um, we've received uh, the green light from council uh, to negotiate uh, with an architect uh, for their services. So. We're hoping to have that finalized within the next week. And uh, from then, um, the work will definitely uh, begin. And uh, that's going to keep us busy for sure. Um, Four Far mm -hmm. Park, um, if you've driven by uh, that park, you'll see that it has start, uh, started to be redeveloped. And um, we're expecting that project to be completed in the early spring. Um, yeah, I think we'll hopefully get the pathways and whatnot put in um, uh, before the, the frost hits and uh, the playground equipment and um, the uh, shelter and fitness equipment will be put in in the spring. Um, so that sort of leads me to uh, Farrier and uh, Douglas Park. Um, we're sort of, we're looking um, at an early spring for um, that equipment as well. Um, we've, um, we finished the RFP, um, the playground and companies have been uh, selected. And uh, yeah, hopefully early spring, uh, we'll see new uh, playground equipment there. And uh, Graham Park is, a, is another small park that we've, um, we're updating. And uh, it's, um, yeah, we're working with the developer uh, that's, um, that's put us, uh, some work into that uh, redoing, I call it the chicken coops, um, just beside the park uh, that used to be there. There's a, a nice uh, condo building there now. Uh, so we're working with them. There, so there'll be a playground um, and a pathway through that park. Um, and I'm, I'm going to assume um, next summer that should be completed. That's, um, I think that's pretty much all the updates I have. Um, does anybody have any questions or something that uh, you want to chat about on a on a personal note i just wanted to say i worked for elections canada during the election and we used the sportsplex and uh, your people were great that's all i wanted to say they just came through in a number of little incidents and changing the way we brought people in so good on you guys perfect thanks Brian. i'll pass that on Anyone else? I'll just uh, make a few comments about uh, Four for Park because Matt and I had to have a phone call the other day. Um, they are removing a lot of dirt uh, or digging up a lot of dirt. There's a lot of topsoil there. And, and when they're putting it back together, they need a stronger base. So five, six years down the road, we don't have stuff <laughs> sinking into the ground. So just so everybody on this committee is aware, there is no truth to the rumor that spread through town like wildfire that there was contaminated soil there. It was good quality topsoil that needed to be moved because good quality topsoil will grow plants. It will not hold fitness equipment and walking paths and sun shelters. So that's why there's so much dirt being dug up. It's got nothing to do with contamination. So just to be clear on that, and Matt, thanks for clarifying that for me because it Put out a few fires yeah. yesterday. No problem. I'm glad you brought that up, Neil. I I, uh, I should have spoke to that. Thanks. 
Anything else? Moving on to cultural and special events. I'm not sure who's doing this. Is that Spencer? Well, I wasn't sure if Spencer, if Dorothy had uh, asked you to do any update, if we have an update prepared. Um, otherwise we can allow her to update us at the next meeting. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. Um, if anyone has any questions, I could try and answer them, but um, I didn't have anything prepared for tonight. Okay. Okay. And does anyone have any questions? Okay. Then Pat. Right, so departmental and capital projects update. Um, so just to, uh, as, as uh, Councillor Dunsmore mentioned, we're thick and deep into um, the budget. We had a budget meeting on September 7th and on October 4th. And through those processes, we have uh, pretty much put an early stamp on the capital items that will uh, be considered for the 2022 uh, year. Obviously, um, final dollars and every the whole budget has to be passed. But I just wanted to share some of the um, projects that are in uh, proposed in the queue for 2022. Um, uh, the paving of the parking lot at the Sportsplex. So there's two areas of the Sportsplex that have um, need uh, paving. And so in 2022 and in 2023, we're planning to spend $55,000 each year to address some of those parking issues. Um, Matt, did you want to share exactly where those areas are? Sure, no, I, I believe the one um, is the uh, back parking lot. Um, a lot of people um, will be quite happy about that one. And uh, there's um, some areas uh, that we have to fix up at the front uh, where it's uh, very brittle. So th those are the two areas we're going to be concentrating on. Thank you. Um, the other project that's in the queue is Milligan Park plan implementation. So many, uh, many years ago, Milligan Park was part of a new neighborhood and no playground or park development was part of that. It's just a grass green space. So um, we've allocated 130,000 to implement the park plan, which was approved uh, when Andy Goldie was director of Parks and Rec. So uh, we're excited to see that move forward. Um, there's also a plan to um, install a windscreen at the Pavilion Shelter at Maple Park, and that is in Bellwood. And that is a project we're partnering with the Bellwood Lions and they're contributing funds to, um, to help with that. Um, so that'll be on top of the $6,300 that uh, the township is contributing. There's uh, 150,000 allocated for neighborhood interconnections. And what that is, is um, wherever we have trails and roads and sidewalks, um, what we're trying to do is connect trails and systems to have uh, better interconnectivity for people to travel and use the trails and sidewalks and paths and roads um, to get to destinations safely. Um, walking and riding their bikes. So um, Matt Allen is um, coming to council at the next set of budget meetings to update on the details of that. But that is money that we typically put away um, aside every year to build on that project. And it's all part of the Trails Masters plan. There's also the urban forestry where we have budgeted $200,000. And that is a ongoing uh, project to uh, improve the tree canopy um, in Centre Wellington. And uh, just on that note, uh, one of the things that will be released in October is a survey, which uh, we'll bring to your attention when it's released. I'm not sure if Kendra is still on the call, but uh, she'll be helping staff with releasing that. And that is uh, with respect to a um, public tree bylaw. Um, so that uh, people would be required to get a permit before they can uh, damage or remove a tree that is a public tree. So um, that will be coming and we'll be sharing those details. But uh, the first step on that is to release the survey. Uh, the concept of a public tree bylaw was taken to council and council asked that we have, gather more details, finalize what the bylaw would look like and gather public feedback. So that's what we're in the process of doing. Um, the barrier free path of travel is another 245,000 allocated in 2022. And uh, the um, 
the law around accessibility is that public facilities must meet AODA standards by the year 2025. So um, this is funding we use every year to uh, improve um, accessibility in our facilities. And uh, so there's a few projects at the Sportsplex, Bellwood Hall is another one. And then we hope to address a lot of issues at the ECC with that uh, construction project. And then we should be pretty close to the finish line on making sure that our public facilities are accessible in, physically in, in Centre Wellington as facilities. Um, any questions about those key capital projects? Those are the, the ones that are allocated for 2022. Obviously we continue to work on many other projects that are still in the hopper. Um, from previous seasons because we did not uh, complete all of those during COVID. That was a delay to some projects such as the Bissell Park project, the pavilion uh, that's going up for KIPP. Those were McDonald projects. We also have um, the Allura Community Centre uh, renovation project, which is a massive undertaking for our team. And um, there's a few other things uh, that are still getting worked on that were in previous budgets. So we um, don't have... Um, I, I, as much this year to work on because we're still playing catch up. Any questions about those? I do have another item under my report, but I'll answer any questions. Anyone have a question besides me? You, you mentioned something that intrigued me. You said you're putting up a wind screen. Yeah, I'll let Matt answer that. That's uh, at the uh, Maple Park. <clears throat> Yeah, no, um, met up with um, the Bellwood Lions um, earlier this year, and um, it's a project they've been chatting about uh, for the past couple where, um, and it, I guess, uh, well, it came um, this year when, when they were meeting actually at the pavilion for their Bellwood uh, Lions meetings, and um, they really noticed that uh, there's a fair amount of wind coming off the lake. And I uh, thought it'd be more enjoyable um, having a windscreen there where it uh, would help protect uh, families and, and uh, people using that uh, facility. So um, the windscreen, it, it, you know, it's very similar material to the windscreen we'd have um, at uh, the tennis courts. Um, it, it would be a retractable um, screen that would be, be able to go up and down uh, and it'll, it would be um, two corners of uh, the picnic pavilion. Where, um, so it'd be the lakeside and um, uh, facing the west, those, those two corners. Okay, that's great. I, I used to work for a wind engineering firm. So when I hear the word wind windscreen, I think of many thousands of windscreens that were developed in our company. Anyway, Neil. Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, thank Pat um, because Milligan Park has been uh, a bone of contention in my ward for a long time. People kept wondering when it was going to be done. And I did get the comment from two gentlemen uh, during the election that I'll be dead before you do it. Check the other day, both are alive. So let's get that, uh, let's get that built. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. If there are no other questions on that yeah. item, I'm just going to um, continue on if that's okay, Brian. Yes, please. Okay. So I just wanted to also bring back to this committee um, a report that was taken to council on the OLG funding for 2022. Um, as we sort of uh, put off a year of developing detailed uh, funding criteria, mostly because it looks like the estimated amount that will be available for funding in 2022 for arts, culture and heritage is $32,000, which is nowhere near where we were uh, pre-COVID. Um, so uh, we have uh, moved forward to let everyone know that there will be an application process online and funds will be awarded by council as they have been in the past. So we're kind of um, the process of previous allocations uh, will continue. And that was um, uh, confirmed in a recommendation that was adopted by council um, to, uh, I'm not sure if you want me to read the whole thing, but basically um, that the Council of the Township of Centre Wellington directs staff to use the existing OLG funding allocation policy as outlined in bylaw 21941 for the 2022 budget purposes with the policy to be reviewed as part of the 2023 budget process. And that the council 
of the Township of Centre Wellington direct staff to initiate a 2022 grant application process for the arts, cultural and heritage portion of the OLG proceeds with applications received and reviewed and allocated by council um, at the subsequent to the 2022 budget approval. So I just wanted to share that uh, we had chatted about uh, the role this committee will play likely in the development of the policy, which was delayed a year in doing that. So that will be something that we will um, pick up as a project in 2022 prior to the 2023 budget and make recommendations on how that uh, funding would be allocated. I just wanted to share that. I'm not sure if Councillor Dunsmore has anything else to add on that. That was sort of, uh, that it concludes my department update if anyone else has any questions. Thanks so much, Pat. Good, good projects there. Neil, did you want to respond? No, I don't think there's anything to add. I think Pat, Pat covered it all. You know, we, there's not a lot of money there to allocate this time, but we have to use the same formula and, and how it works out, it works out. And, and that's, it's going to make the granting process a little more competitive. And um, there's just not a lot to go around until the, the economy recovers from this COVID, so. Great. Okay, with that being said, um, that's the end of the agenda for this evening. Is there anything that anyone else would like to raise or, or throw into the mix just before we head off to Thanksgiving weekend? Okay, well, um, I, I assume that by consensus, we can, uh, we can end this meeting and, uh, and uh, put it in the history book and look forward to gathering again on November the 3rd. In the meantime, have a great Thanksgiving and uh, let's hope uh, we don't see snow anytime before November 3rd. Okay, Thanks, I'll, go on, I'll go on record right now, Brian. If we see snow anytime soon, it's because you took your snow shovel down. You said that was part of the meeting, so I'm laying it at your feet right now. I should I should never have mentioned it. You you're right. You shouldn't. Have. I pr I promise not to get my snow tires on either. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving, thanks, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, thanks, staff, for all the good input. Much appreciated.